Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game faction focus for the Onyx Contact Force. In this video we're talking about who OCF are, how they play, what makes them unique and different, as well as some of their limitations before jumping into Infinity Army to cover some, but not all, of the profiles that comprise the faction. Now, as always, this video comes with a caveat that these are just my own thoughts and experiences with regards to Onyx. I am not necessarily an expert in how OCF plays, and if you are an experienced Onyx Contact Force player who feels that I've missed something or has something to add, please do say so in the comments. It really does make a difference. As always, big thanks to channel supporters who have made these videos possible. This video was at the request of channel supporter Sneaky Snake. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by donating via the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below, or by becoming a YouTube channel member. Now, Onyx Contact Force thematically are the first contact division of the Ur Hegemony and are comprised of representatives of all of the species that make up Combined Army. This means you'll find Exra and Morats and Shazvastii and, notably, members of the Ur Hegemony species itself in the form of Nexus operatives as well as the Umbra, all present under the banner of Onyx Contact Force. Now, this can make OCF appear as though they were an elite faction or a tag faction, but I'm going to make the argument that actually kind of they're secretly not. In my opinion, Onyx Contact Force are differentiated from Morad Aggression Force, Shazvastii, and Vanilla Combined Army by having a 14 plus point linkable line troop that you actually want to take, which is materially different from Morat and Shazvastii, for example, where Vanguard Infantry and Shazvastii Nox troops aren't necessarily terrible, but they aren't the strength of the faction. You aren't going to those factions because you're really keen to play more at vanguards, for example. You're going, them, going to them for the other options. Onyx Contact Force are different. The core basic trooper, the Unidron of Onyx Contact Force, is actually fascinating as a vehicle for link team force multiplication and other force multiplication. And the presence of this piece as a core element on which you can build the rest of the faction really materially impacts how Onyx Contact Force play and what makes them different to other combined army sectorals. Unidrons and Nexus Troopers are going to be the first two profiles that I cover, and they're going to be the first two profiles for a reason. They really are the core of Onyx Contact Force. Now, we'll talk about them more in detail when we get into Infinity Army, but the presence of these core, solid, basic, line troop style remotes and infantry means that Onyx Contact Force play as kind of a fire teams faction. And in fact, Onyx Contact Force have access not just to a core link, but to two Harris teams, which they can make good use of thanks to Unidrons and similar profiles. Now, these fire teams aren't necessarily like, say, for example, Rama Task Force Ghulam fire teams, where you use the fact that there are just so many weird and varied Ghulam profiles to make interesting and diverse fire teams that then maybe like one gun troop drops into. In Onyx Contact Force, you have your utility taken care of by the Nexus operatives, and the Unidrons do the fighting. And they really are capable of like March of the Machine style fighting, thanks to all of the various things that make Unidrons unique. Now, that in turn means that in addition to being a fire teams faction, Onyx Contact Force are one of the rare examples in Infinity of what I would call a supportware faction. If you are anything like me, then your learning journey with Infinity, at some point early on, you found the rules for Evo Hackers, and you went, oh wow, buff spells in my sci-fi war game? Yeah, actually, I want some of that, please. For basically as long as they've existed, Evo Hackers have been a really interesting and compelling design part of Infinity, but very, very rarely were they ever actually like a core element of any faction's play. There are some exceptions, but really those exceptions are basically just Operation Subsection in Aleph and Onyx Contact Force in Combined Army, and it is no surprise that those two factions are the most remote heavy factions in the game. So, if you like supportware, Onyx Contact Force actually are huge users of supportware, and you will probably see an E-Drone, that's the Combined Army Evo Hacker, in almost every OCF force. The next thing that makes Onyx Contact Force genuinely unique is that they really are the game's, probably the game's only 
plasma faction. Now, yes, plasma is just an ammunition type, and there is no other army that I would say, oh, well, this is the viral faction. In my Toha faction focus, for example, yes, Toha have viral ammunition, but it's not the reason that you go to Toha. But there is a huge gulf between plasma ammunition and literally every other kind of ammo in the game in the terms of weapons that you have access to and how it works. Basically, I cannot say enough good things about plasma. It is just so fucking hot. Plasma ammunition works against everything. Total immunity is not effective against it. Plasma weapons are always templates, which means their effective power is much higher than you would think at first glance. And because they hit both armor and BTS, there is nothing that is necessarily really, really strong against them. Your opponent is an armor 5, BTS 0, Ariadne and Bear, no freaking problem. Plasma will cut through that like butter. Your opponent is an armor 8, BTS 6 tag. Yep, cool. This is a template weapon. It's hitting both of those attributes, which means you can at least somewhat zero in on the lower BTS. Your opponent is BTS 9, but only armor 3? Yep, no problem. Plasma is a threat to that. There is nothing that plasma isn't threatening against, and you can have so much plasma in an OCF list that you are just packing what can only be described as an extreme amount of heat. Finally, on top of all of that, OCF are a very credible hacking faction. Not necessarily in the same vein as like the elite super hacker style of OSS, for example, with the Asura, but Onyx Contact Force meet those basic requirements of having good network projection, by which I mean they have good access to pitches, they don't really have to compromise too much to be able to deploy repeaters on or around their opponents, and they have serviceable hacking and in particular quite solid killer hacking. Now, I don't usually recommend playing Onyx Contact Force as a guided missile faction. I don't think they're set up well enough for that for a few reasons. Firstly, they tend to be SWC limited. Secondly, their spotlight capable pieces tend to have average willpower. But it costs you very little to splat hacking into an Onyx Contact Force list, and with that have the ability to go after enemy hackers, do killer hacking things, establish hacking dominance, and just then have hacking as a utility to round out what your list does. Now, in terms of limitations, Onyx Contact Force are a Pan-Oceanian style faction. They have no warbands and no smoke, which means that if you are going to move across the table, you need to do so either with superior firepower or the use of marker states. And there are some interesting marker state models in Onyx Contact Force, but really most of the time it is superior firepower that is going to open up the board for you and enable you to move. On top of that, Onyx Contact Force is a faction with some traps built into the pieces that you have access to. There are just a ton of like elite luxury pieces in OCF, which are not necessarily bad, and in fact you will often try and find a way to put one or two of them into a list, but it's easy to look at OCF and just try and put in all of those like 35 to 40 to 50 to 60 point pieces, and you can't support those. You are a line troop list using 14 point line troopers, those aren't 10 point line troopers. You have to pay that premium to get those pieces that form the basis of your list, and yes, you do have some cheaper ordered generators, but ultimately in Onyx Contact Force you need to limit yourself and not overinvest in the elite and flashy things. So a classic example, for example, are things like Kodali, who is just very, very expensive for a single wound trooper. I have a local who has been on a three-year journey to try and make her work and has not succeeded to date. And things like, for example, the Zeodron tag Harris. The idea of being able to Harris link tags sounds very, very cool, but that link costs you almost half of your entire army and leaves you very, very thin anywhere else. It can be made to work, but it's it's a sometimes food, and it's the basics of Onyx Contact Force that we want to really look at and pay attention to, because once you have the fundamentals in your list construction down, that's when you can start expanding out into the luxury pieces and figuring out which of those one or two luxury pieces you'd like to include in a list that then works for you. They are a faction where you really, really do have to put aside your dessert and have that last. You have to have your meat and vegetables first, or the faction won't function well. Fortunately, that meat and vegetables part of the faction, the baseline that once you build everything else, the bones are very solid and offer an interesting and unique playstyle, which leads us quite neatly into the first profile we're going to look at. Now, we're going to spend proportionally a bit less time talking in general terms and a bit more time talking about profiles in this faction focus, because it really is a collection of profiles that makes Onyx Contact Force what it is, and none more so than the Unidron Batroids. 
there's a lot going on with these guys and we do need to talk about the bulk of it. So, Unidron Batroids are effectively the line troops, and indeed we can see their line troops in the unit description of the Onyx Contact Force, but they are a remote. Because they are a remote, they can be subject to support wear, in particular the ability to give them marksmanship, which will significantly supplement their basic ballistic skill of 11. In addition, you can core link them, and it's very easy, you should always be aiming to get core link bonuses on your core link of Unitron Batroids droids, which means that most of the link will be Ballistic Skill 14 before range or cover modifiers, and the one model that you'll have selected to give marksmanship to will be firing at effective Ballistic Skill 17. These guys aren't just your one big gun though, because we can see the basic profile has a plasma carbine. I mentioned before that Onyx Contact Force are a plasma faction, and this is part of why. Your Unidron Batroid link isn't just your plasma sniper, although, by the way, hot damn, what a weapon is a plasma sniper. Damage 15, template, plasma ammunition, burst 2, up to burst 3 in the link. This thing is a threat to literally every model in the entire game if it connects. It is truly terrifying, and it is also, among other things, the highest damage template weapon outside of troopers with bonuses to damage on their ballistic skill attacks. But it's the basic plasma carbine unit on that we're going to start with. This guy, in a link team, just watching a corner out to 16 inches, has a burst 2 BS-14 in ARO, or burst 3 BS-14 in active plasma weapon, which means it is effectively that plasma carbine is being multiplied up to a full plasma rifle, and that weapon is a burst 3 dangerous template weapon. Unidrons also come with a suite of relatively useful abilities. They dodge kind of okay. They have a native bonus to discover that significantly helps make up for their low willpower of 12. They have an interesting ARM-1 BTS of 6, which sets them aside from, for example, Dakinis. And they have the Dogged Shock Immune Remote Presence ability combination. Now, I've talked about this in the faction before, in the channel before, for example, in the Sujan, but it's important to note how Remote Presence and Dogged combine. Remote Presence gives you two unconscious levels, which means that a Unidron Batroid that takes a first wound goes unconscious, takes a second wound goes into unconscious level two, only after taking a third wound does it die, and you can use that interaction to take, for example, two wounds during your active turn and then enter Dogged. So say a Unidron Batroid cops an explosive round from a missile, and it passes two and saves one of those armor rolls. It'll take two wounds, enter unconscious two, and can choose to become dogged in that activation and continue to fight. This means that even though they are only single wound troopers, attacking into linked Unidrons can be just truly, truly difficult to do because you have an entire link or most of an entire link of reactively very credible troopers, all of whom are putting out these burst two plasma or missile shots and which you have to potentially kill multiple times. Now, once a model goes dogged, it doesn't matter if it has those unconscious states, a single wound will cause a dogged model to go dead, but that offensive or defensive capability, that resilience that you don't get, for example, in something like Operation Subsection, helps cement Unidron as the basis for this faction. Now, on top of just having Dogged, you should also remember that this is still a remote presence remote, which means that you can reroll engineering rolls. They're difficult to kill. You should be thinking about playing Onyx Contact Force with some engineers for the ability to force reconstitute. You don't always want to use Dogged. When you're using Unidrons, if you take a wound on a Unidron, you want to think in that moment, do I need this model to go Dogged to prevent an attack from continuing into my deployment zone, for example, or to continue attacking with this model? Or can I let it go on? conscious and safely reconstitute it. One of the biggest mistakes I think you can make is, as OCF is to always trigger Dogged on your Unidrons rather than trying to keep your force intact if you think you can by using Engineers. OCF are a faction that can have a relatively okay wound count, but they can't spam wounds in the same way that some other factions can. You want to instead use your ability to repair to keep yourself in the fight and your order count high. Now, because of that combination of core link bonuses and the ability to give them marksmanship, Unidrons will often also be your primary firebase. And for that reason, you, you're looking at those SWC profiles in addition to the Blaze base plasma carbine as important elements of the faction. So, for example, the plasma sniper and missile launcher are both pieces that you want to consider including in an Onyx Contact Force list. The missile launcher is obviously the scariest of the two as an ARO piece. 
Although if you have the points, the Plasma Sniper has better range bands and is better as an active turn weapon. And then yes, the Plasma Sniper is the better of the two for active turn use and is often going to be, if you have one, the primary recipient of marksmanship for as long as it's alive. Having one or more of those Plasma Snipers as the pieces that will enable your other elements to move forward and close with the enemy, basically the Plasma Sniper saying, if you present a hard ARO, I am going to kill it from 40 inches away if need be, that is one of the things that you want to think about including in OCF lists. Now there are some other profiles in here as well that are interesting and useful. There are K1 combi rifles, although generally I would lean towards the Plasma Carbines, noting the points difference and the general applicability of Plasma. There is a Tinbot profile, which if it it didn't cost SWC, I would consider excellent, but SWC is at a bit of a premium in Onyx, so just be careful including that. And then there is a forward observer that you can include if you wanted to just spend one point to make a unit on a specialist, which if you have points spare, you should do. Finally, there's a Spitfire for a high burst weapon. I am going to generally say steer away from the Spitfire, not all of the time, but if in doubt. Your SWC is precious in Onyx Contact Force and you need to be able to engage the enemy at HMG or longer range bands, because if you get locked out of range as Onyx Contact Force, you don't have smoke to enable you to close, so you have to be able to take those fights at long range. For that reason, the Spitfire is a bit of a luxury weapon. Frankly, I would rather have my bases covered by 16 inches and beyond the Plasma Sniper, and then within 16 inches, the Plasma Carbines. In total though, Unidrawn Batroid, Batroids are the core of Onyx. They are an outstanding selection of profiles. You cannot go wrong including multiple of these in a list. And in fact, you can build a list that spams Unidrawn Batroids, although there are enough interesting and varied things in OCF that you want plenty of these, but they aren't the entire force. From Unidron Batroids, we jump into Nexus Operatives, and these are the second half of your serious bread and butter link teams. Now, in addition to just the profile we can see on screen, what is important about Nexus Operatives is that they count as Unidrons for fire team composition bonuses and can join Unidron fire teams. This means you can have core and Harris teams mixing Unidrons and Nexus Operatives, where the Unidrons do the fighting and the dying, and the Nexus Operatives add the unique capabilities, the specialists, the hackers, the enemies engineers, etc. So if we look at Nexus Operatives, we can see they have a few skills that make them stand out. Dodge plus three is nice to have, particularly if you have six cents and are being targeted by templates or missiles, but importantly, they are NCOs. Every Nexus is an NCO, which means that it can spend the Lieutenant Order, including to activate fire teams, and they are not paying a premium for that. If we look at how these profiles are split out, we can see that most of these Nexus operatives are only paying two points for the privilege of being an NCO, which is really quite nice. They're also BS-12, usually armed with things like combi rifles, which is fine. They will gunfight if they have to, but that's not really their purpose. Now, Basically all of the profiles with the exception of the nanoscreen Spitfire profile, I would say are things you wanted to consider including in your lists. The Nexus are good specialists to add to Unidron links. They have higher willpower than the basic Unidron forward observer in addition to being an NCO, which is excellent. The hacker, including the hacker lieutenant, if you're so inclined, but generally speaking, I would probably be inclined to make just one of the regular specialist operatives my lieutenant, but the hacker is a fine hacker. Adding a hacker to things like Unidron link teams, you're going to want some generic hacking in Onyx Contact Force armies, and 23 points for combi rifle EM mines, hacking device, and NCO to throw into a link is fine. It's very serviceable. And then the engineer, which is an NCO engineer that can be added to remote link teams this is where we start to see some of the things that differentiate Onyx Contact Force from, for example, ALEF Operations Subsection, where ALEF has very, very good engineers, or more accurately, ALEF has one really, really good engineer, which has to then, is, is not expensive, in fact, it's devilishly cheap because it's a post-human, but it has to pay for Yudbots, it has to then spend orders moving those Yudbots around, whereas you can have engineers just embedded in link teams right alongside the Unidrons that they're there to recover, and they have Vulcan shotguns, dechargers, are a specialist. It is a match made in relative heaven. Most OCF lists wants to at least start with a Unidron and Nexus link team and genuinely seriously consider a Unidron and Nexus Harris team because they work very, very well thanks to how good in close range duels the Unidrons can be. Although admittedly in a Harris team, your link bonuses are down to just the burst bonus, which means that you're firing at just ballistic skill 11, but even a Unidron at ballistic skill 11, thanks to the danger of plasma ammunition, is a somewhat scary threat. 
Now paired with the Nexus operatives, we have our character Nexus, Nexus operative, Nexus 7 operative Kernel, who has a killer hacking device, which has the white noise program. This is not the only access to white noise that you will have in Onyx Contact Force, but the only access to white noise that we will cover and the only one I recommend taking. But having white noise in a faction otherwise has no visibility control is quite nice. Otherwise has all of the usual stuff you expect from Nexus operatives, but we have, in addition to just everything else, we have a plasma rifle, not a carbine, a rifle and a pitcher. Now, Kernow is just a one wound model and you often won't have a doctor or paramedic available. That is something to bear in mind, but there is no other way to get burst for plasma in the entire game. Kernow, to my knowledge, Kernow is burst for plasma and plasma, as we've mentioned, is very scary. For only 27 points and zero SWC, he will add a lot to an Onyx Contact Force list, but mostly what we're taking him for is we can slap him into a link team, either a Core or a Harice. He's linked, linking burst to that pitcher, and he's a killer hacker, so he will ably go and hunt enemy hackers by shooting pitchers to land next to them, using those firewall bonuses to give himself an advantage in subsequent fight, and then trinitying enemy hackers to death. And you really want to do that in Onyx Contact Force because, as we've just mentioned, you have a lot of hackable pieces because you're using remotes and hackers as much of your list. Onyx Contact Force have good reason to usually try and include two killer hackers or equivalent model in a list, just so that you have that ability to hunt down enemy hackers, ensure that there aren't passive threats to your ability to move across the table. Kernow helps facilitate that. And for that reason, again, not in every list, but he is part of the bread and butter of your faction and you should seriously consider him. Every now and again, you will try and gunfight with him and he will lose a gunfight and you'll be kind of sad because he's just a single wound model. But equally likely, if you get him inside 16 inches of an enemy tag and just open up, he's a threat to even an enemy tag because he has access to plasma ammunition. Now, rounding out our subsequent core package, we have the E-Drone. I've spoken at great length about supportware and how useful supportware is to Onyx Contact Force. Usually you'll be looking to use the marksmanship supportware but because you've taken an e-drone, you also have the option of building around perhaps potential use of assisted combat jump. And that's perfectly reasonable as well, because you've already sunk your cost into the e-drone, you have good reason to take it because you really do want to be able to buff those unidrons. And since you've taken it already, there is no additional cost to including it. So taking drop troops becomes just a little more feasible. And there are some interesting drop troops that we'll talk about in Onyx Contact Force in just a little bit. Now, before we move on, the e-drone is worth looking at in particular as a unique kind of Evo hacker. Unlike every other Evo hacker in the game, it is a little more expensive at 18 points compared to the standard 15 points, but it's on a much better silhouette at silhouette three. It has terrain total and six four move, and it has a gun, which means that by including an e-drone in your list, you aren't just getting an Evo hacker, which you are and is excellent. You are also getting a highly mobile specialist with a very relevant specialist bonus in many lists. On top of that, in a few ITS scenarios in ITS season 15, there is further incentive to take an Evo hacker, but you get an extra bonus in some missions for just having one in your list. And while for some other factions, they might feel like they have to shoehorn the Evo hacker in there, in Onyx Contact Force, absolutely not. You're putting one of these in many of your lists. They're excellent, both on their own merits and for their combination with other models in your faction. And therefore that's just a bonus that OCF is pleasantly suited to receiving easily the best Evo hacker in the game. Admittedly, there is basically no competition. They are the only one that is different and unique, but just super useful to have access to and part of what makes OCF interesting and different. Now, before we jump on to some of the luxury pieces or interesting and different pieces that you have access to in OCF, we're just going to pause briefly and dwell on the uh, order generating plebs that you have access to in OCF. You are not going to have access to 10 point line troopers, but you do have access to 9 point Icadron Batroids, and these are worth serious consideration. For 9 points, you get a Light Flamethrower plus 1 burst on a 6 2 profile with baggage and a repeater. Those are all useful things. You do want some access to repeaters in this faction because Evo hackers need a repeater to be able to put support wear down. Some of those programs are infinite range, but assisted fire needs the target to initially be inside the Evo Hackers repeater area. So Icadron Batroid is very useful for that reason, and they are one of the few examples of template defense that you have access to in the faction. Unidrons as a defensive element are very credible, but if something comes at you and you just want to fire a, a 
direct template at it in order to cause it to try and dodge or just automatically take the hit. It's basically Icadrons or more or less bust. However, they are a remote presence remote, which means that if they do trade on the defense, then fantastic, you have the ability to recover them with your engineers, further reason to take an engineer in Onyx Contact Force. And in comparison to some other pieces of the same type, the fact that they have that light flamethrower plus one burst, plus one burst makes it scary, they can, if they need to, combine that with their Ballistic Skill 11 pistol to do some actual, uh, you know, at offensive forking. If your opponent declares a dodge, you can still oppose it with a Ballistic Skill attack. Broadly, though, these are just a high utility piece for nine points, and one of the two pieces you will include in your list if you are going maybe a little bit more top-heavy and need to just make up your orders. AVA2 is excellent. Again, if you're taking more elite pieces, you can fill out to 15 points thanks to Icadron Batroids. The second of those two pieces that you can use to get to 15 orders, rather, if you need to, is the Imatron. At six points, these things are a little more expensive than they used to be, but they are an order for six points that happens to be veteran, and which you just sort of yeet onto the table, try and put them in a safe space. If they fail their combat jump, try and put them on your table edge somewhere in total cover. Now, although Onyx Contact Force does have access to Chain of Command, uh, it costs you SWC to access Chain of Command in this faction which means that having access to just a few veteran pieces actually can really go a long way in helping to ensure you against, say, having your lieutenant sniped. Uh, Onyx Contact Force can be a little susceptible to having semi-visible lieutenants. For example, if you take Norkaius as your lieutenant, it's very obvious that he is your LT, thanks to his willpower score. And knowing that you have even just a couple of veteran troops can help get you through a turn of loss of lieutenant if you've elected not to take chain of command. Now, unlike, say, Vanilla Combined Army, where they tend to play very top-heavy and then very bottom-heavy, and so Imatrons appear quite a lot in Vanilla Combined Army lists, even at six points, in OCF you can do more of that thing where you have 15 troopers that all do something, which can let you shave Imatrons out of your list, but if you are taking more expensive or more elite pieces, you will find that they reappear, including alongside things like, say, Flash Pulse remotes. Now, just a couple more core elements to talk about before we get into some of the more interesting and weird stuff. One of those two is Bit and Kiss. Now, just incidentally, if you noticed, wow, there's a lot of core stuff in Onyx Contact Force. Yes, that was one of the interesting strengths and dynamics of the faction in that we have this really broad array of stuff that costs 6 to 15 to 20 odd points. That means that we have this basis in the faction to build from, and that is part of what makes Onyx Contact Force this interesting kind of like mid-range supportware remote fire team plasma faction that you want to splash luxuries into. But in terms of this mid-range, Bit and Kiss pair very, very nicely with Kernow and with whatever other hackers we may be taking. They've been some of the best network projection and hacking pieces in the game since they arrived way, way back in N3, and they are just truly, truly excellent. So if we look at this profile, I mean, anyone who's played Infinity for any length of time is probably familiar with them by now, but what we have here firstly is Bit herself is a Whip 13, BS11, Armor 0, but BTS 6 hacker with Mine Layer and a deployable repeater, so she helps get another repeater into your deployment zone, and then a Pitcher for network projection. Typically, she will then be a killer hacking device who has, and this is just incredible luxury, the Oblivion upgrade program, which means that even if your opponent, all of their killer, all of their own hackers are dead, you still have real and genuine AROs that you can be taking against things like enemy tags and HI and remote, etc. And she is paired with her remote, Kiss, who also, typically speaking, has a pitcher, in Kiss's case, a pitcher plus one burst, which means that the two of these models, although their ballistic skill is only 11, once they get into an okay range band, which they can do by using Kiss's bits ability to mark a state them because she has a killer hacking device, Kiss is a synchronized remote, which means any programs that affect her will affect him, so she can cyber mask and cyber mask Kiss along with her, use that to move forward, and then fire burst three pitchers sort of into the enemy's table space. If you've judged the range band correctly, they'll be hitting on 14s, which means that it's pretty likely that you'll land out of that burst three. Usually two shots is pretty relative, pretty reasonable to expect. And you have, in addition, Kiss's deployable repeaters if you need them, and then you'll, you'll have your final burst with your deployable pitcher on bit if you need to. So what that means is that just by herself, even if you haven't taken Kernel, just by herself, if you've got a baggage bot somewhere, she and Kiss can just spam out repeaters, which gives you that network projection that you need to make hacking annoying and offensive and the ability to go after enemy hackers even in their deployment zone. 
Now, she is a rare example of a killer hacker that does cost SWC, but I would say she is very worthwhile. And while you may choose to not take her in some OCF lists, for example, if you're building for a specific scenario or if you're building for a specific matchup, so say you were going to be playing against a faction where you didn't expect to need to go after enemy hackers with your KHDs, you might cut her to save the SWC. She is very, very worthwhile and part of that core of the faction. And of course, we wouldn't be fairly covering the core of Onyx Contact Force without touching at least briefly on the Q drone. It's just a total reaction bot, except it has mimetism. And if that sounds horrific and obscene, I assure you that it is. Particularly if you can spare marksmanship from your Unidrons to go onto the Q drone, dealing with these things can just be an absolute tick. And basically, the thing about the Q drone is that it's good by itself, it is just good on its own merits. But in Onyx Contact Force, you have all of the infrastructure already in place to support it. You were probably already taking an engineer. You were probably already taking an Evo hacker. In fact, the only thing that maybe forces Q drones out of lists is that if you've taken enough Unidrons, you might just not have capacity to support wear it, which it would kind of like. But even if you're not support wearing it, it's still a total reaction remote with mimetism, which means that it is just extra annoying to fight. Enemy tags going after the Q drone will often be fighting at four dice on 11s versus four dice on 11s, which can take a really long time to resolve. Given that as OCF, we don't necessarily have access to a huge plethora of close-in defenses, we're going to potentially want to use big guns to stall the enemy out at range as we play as a Pan-Oceanian style faction. Having something like a Q drone is an excellent addition to your force mix. The plasma rifle is a bit more of a niche choice because again, we are playing a Pano style faction here, which means that we have to have access to superior firepower to push our way forward. And playing paying one SWC for a plasma rifle begins to make it a little bit less appealing. We need that SWC elsewhere, but I'm much more willing to pay for HMG range bands on a total reaction bot. Now, from here, it's time to start getting weird, and we're going to make it weird with the vector operator as the first of three extra profiles that we're going to be looking at. Now, the extra are the newest addition to Onyx Contact Force and, in fact, Combined Army generally, and they are linkable only as a Harris team, but they are linkable in OCF. Extra all share basically a variety of qualities, the first of which is, of course, the extra rule, which is one of the few malice rules in the game. It is not a beneficial rule. Uh, an extra that takes a wound passes immediately to dead. They have no unconscious state, represent the fragility of their carapaces, etc. But that comes with a discount to this profile, which means that you will typically see extra models packing just an absolute ton of random rules and equipment. They don't usually have particularly high or special like attributes. We're not seeing you know, like tons and tons of ballistic skill there, for example. But they have just enough extras, uh, just enough extras in other sort of interesting and different spaces that the extra rule keeps them down within a reasonable points cost. And the vector is the the gunfighter, the first of these pieces, and part of the reason why you're taking a Harris link is to be able to link this bad boy. Although he's only Ballistic Skill 12, he has the wonderful combination of Mimetism minus three and a multispectral visor, which means that we're going to usually want to use this guy for gunfighting. And given that we're often a little bit SWC squeezed in Onyx Contact Force, it's the multi-marksman profile that I recommend most. This gives you access to armor-piercing rounds at burst four in a Harris team on a very mobile piece. He's 6-2 move with super jump, which is wonderful, in addition to having terrain total. And so basically, this guy is a highly mobile 0.5 SWC, thoroughly credible back pocket gunfighter that you can use as part of a utility Harris team. And again, Onyx have access to two Harris teams in their faction, which means that you can take him in addition to another Harris team and basically have your extra, your Unidrons, maybe more Unidrons or some other kind of Harris, all functioning, potentially giving you something like 11 or even 12 linkable models in OCF. Now, vector operators are only AVA1, which means we need to pair them with some other things. But just in addition to everything we talked about in terms of gunfighting, let's just take a moment to appreciate how good this guy is at doing certain classifieds. One of the problems with having a very remote-centric faction is that some missions, and those include things like evacuation, for example, but also just any mission that has a lot of classifieds, can leave you a little bit high and dry in terms of ability to comfortably do the mission. And the vector operator is one of the pieces that really helps you solve for that. So if we look at this profile, we can see that the vector is medium infantry, an elite troop, has a multispectral visor level two, 
all of which collectively means that the vector can do, I did a count of this, something like 10 of the 20 classifieds by himself, although that, yes, does, of course, include things that everyone can do, like extreme prejudice. Sorry, predator is what it's called. Now they combine those two classifieds. So having things like the vector operators and the other pieces that join the extra Harris team means that you have just that little bit of extra ability to comfortably do classifieds. You have more classified coverage. That's something that's very valuable to a faction that is otherwise trading heavily on things like remotes, which can't, for example, civivac civilians, which makes the vector just that much more useful. Ultimately, just ballistic skill 12, no ability to core link. It's always going to be firing only on 12s, but it will be firing on 12s against everything because of that multispectral visor level 2, which you combine with mimetism gives the vector the perfect ability basically to, to win gunfights when and where it needs to. And the super jump, particularly the 6 2 movement super jump, makes it highly mobile, which means it can get where it needs to, which is further differentiating it from things like the Unidrons. Unidrons are, they're not immobile, they're, they're 4 4 dudes, but the vector operation alongside other extra adds an element of vertical mobility, like uniquely vertical mobility, at a price tag that you can otherwise get in Onyx Contact Force, but kind of paying out the nose for. Now, alongside the one vector operator we can take, we can take a number of void operators and base operators. Void operators we'll look at first. These guys are kind of the kitchen sink of the two. Base operators tend to have, let's say, more focused, slightly cleaner profiles but we're interested in the Void Operator because they have NCO. Now you can have Nexus Operatives join an extra link, but one of the things about Super Jump is that it doesn't necessarily combine well with non-Super Jump pieces. Because you're doing a short skill jump, uh, if the other pr troopers in the link don't have the ability to, to declare jump as a short skill, they just idle. And so if we're building an extra link, we are kind of incentivized to, if possible, keep all three of the pieces in that Harry team having super jump. And if we want an NCO in the link, that means we go looking for the void operator. The void operator also has a 360 visor and an X visor for some reason. Like I cannot stress enough how little I care about these pieces, about these rules, but they're not useless. They're just not something I go out of my way looking for. But fortunately we have a couple of profiles here on the void operators that we can use to just kind of like keep the link relatively cheap while still adding this useful NCO capability. The boarding shotgun is totally fine at 19 points, but I also particularly like the 0SWC 21-point SMG killer hacking device. Hackers are a very useful specialist type to have in many lists, and a submachine gun will pair reasonably well with the marksman rifle range bands in terms of letting us engage all the way from 24 inches down to zero with ballistic skill 12 burst 4 AP or shock rounds. Now, given how many other NCOs you can feasibly take in an Onyx Contact Force list, I would say that the Void Operator is a nice to have rather than essential, and I would usually not take more than one of them, but it is still a medium infantry. It's got all of the same stats as the Vector Operator, in particular that Armor 3, which is particularly nice. But I would probably steer away from the Red Fury or Combi Rifle Light Rocket Launcher profiles. We want to be spending our SWC elsewhere. Now, the base operator is our third and final extra piece, and this is usually we'll have one of these or two of these in an extra Harris team, depending on what it is we're trying to do with our points. For me, the two particularly interesting profiles are the 19 point ones. That's a burst four multi-rifle, which goes up to burst five in a link team. Only ballistic skill 11, but burst five can absolutely win face-to-face -face rolls just off of the back of that high number of dice. And then the engineer. The engineer has a boarding shotgun and a decharges, so it's a specialist. And engineer is a very relevant specialist type in Onyx Contact Force because we have all of these remotes floating around. So being able to just drive by repair a Unidron is something that actually is worth paying a few extra points for. And then of course, a boarding shotgun is a great weapon to make up for ballistic skill 11 because we'll just be using that template and then accepting that the model is probably dead. And that's totally fine. If they're fighting at template range, they've probably done their job already. As with the vector and void operators, base operators are an extra troop, which means that they'll go all the way to dead if they take a wound. But as you probably guessed from all of this talk that I have made about uh, remotes and repairability and taking engineers, 
we aren't necessarily taking that many doctors in Onyx Contact Force anyway, so the extra rule is not that much of a downside and in fact just helps us focus our lists a little better. So overall, the extra Haris team, and it's, it's comprised typically of these three pieces, all to have 6-2 move, all to have super jump, all to have sort of like reasonable stats and some utility pieces, the extra are a very interesting addition to Onyx Contact Force that I think it has received well. Kind of collectively, but especially I slept on these for a little while. I didn't mind them, but I didn't think that highly of them. But looking at, and particularly in preparation for this episode, going into Onyx Contact Force and spending a bunch of time building lists has made me appreciate that 0.5 SWC back pocket gunfighter and general utility a lot more than I did just looking at these profiles in total isolation. Now, with our 20 to 30 point profiles all covered, it's time to start looking at the expensive boys, the luxury pieces. And we're gonna start with one of my favorite profiles, the Umbra Samaritan. Now, the Umbra Samaritan is totally linkable in Onyx Contact Force. They can form a Haris team, including the meme Haris team with the Zeodron tags. But generally, I'm gonna recommend saying probably we don't wanna take Umbra Samaritans heavily linked. They worked very well as solo operative pieces, moving, particularly moving in the space that you're big guns create. And my recommended profile by a considerable margin is the hacker profile. Half an SWC gets you a plasma weapon. We're not linking it, so it's just burst two, but it is on a 6-2 super jump platform. You shouldn't be gunfighting with Umbra Samaritans. If you use that weapon, it should either be in desperation as an ARO or because you've got a super jump to land a shot into something that templates a whole bunch of things that your opponent didn't see. Really playing around the combination of template weapons and six inch super jump can be very challenging. It can be difficult to see all of those lanes and all of those lines and doing things like shooting enemy deployable equipment or vulnerable pieces and just getting that splash can produce some just occasional, but some very powerful moments. Beyond that though, the Umbra Samaritan has exceptional close combat score with martial arts level four and that most wonderful and delicious of skills, Prothean. Prothean is one of the skills that makes combined army at large and Onyx Contact Force in particular, alongside Chazvastii, unique in that it is one of the only skills in the entire game where winning a face-to-face -face role doesn't just deplete your opponent's forces, it improves your own. Infinity has basically zero snowball mechanics other than just the way that the game generally progresses, and that makes a weapon or tool that gets you further ahead in and on its own merits rather than just because it puts you further ahead than your opponent relatively because they are diminished, powerful and unique. Prothean is just incredible. It adds wounds to models, which means an Umbra Samaritan can end up as a three wound, no wound in cap model. And that is something that just lets you make some fascinating and interesting plays. It lets you face tank templates on the way into melee. It lets you take fights you have no business taking. Uh, it lets you end the game with this piece that it's just gonna be feasibly impossible for your opponents to remove. It has huge payoff if you can make it work, although don't don't zero in on that, don't have the red mist descend. Umbra Samaritans are a utility piece, they can do a lot of different things. Melee and getting those Prothean wounds is just part of that. Now part of the reason why I recommend the hacker is that it has that wonderful combination of a hacking device with all of the hacking device programs with Trinity on a WIP14 BTS3 platform. If we are already taking, for example, Kernow and Bit and Kiss, we are very well served by adding in something that doesn't just have Trinity, although having three models with Trinity in the list is very nice, but then has the ability to make those spotlights and carbonites and oblivions alongside Bit, who's just making oblivion AROs. Overall, the Samaritan is a very good and very useful piece but it is competed with in that broad point slot in Onyx Contact Force with Norkaius. And in OCF, it's actually one of the rare cases where I would say this comparison is a little different than otherwise. So in combined army, in vanilla combined army, I will typically recommend taking an Umbra Samaritan over Norkaius. You have plenty of smoke to get pieces like the Umbra forward. You have plenty of ability to augment your melee capabilities, say by getting gang up, etc. And the points difference between the two pieces, right? Norkaius, particularly Norkaius in his 47 point profile is very expensive compared to an Umbra Samaritan. And in practice is really kind of a side grade. You gain some things, in particular, you gain CC lethality and the ability to enter a marker state, but you lose utility. You, lo you use, lose the utility of the plasma weapon rounds. You lose the utility of the ability to make non uh, Killer Hacker AROs, Norkaius only has total control. He does not have access to Spotlight and Oblivion, etc. 
And so in a vacuum, the Umbra is typically better value for the points you spend. But in Onyx Contact Force, firstly, we're kind of looking for a Lieutenant profile to take, and there's nothing wrong with taking Norkaius. He is a bit cheaper as a Lieutenant. But the ability to enter a marker state is a bit more meaningful in Onyx Contact Force because in OCF, we don't have that smoke. What we have is superior firepower, hopefully opening a path for our troops to move forward. But if for whatever reason we can't leverage our guns to suppress enemy AROs and open that path, the fact that Norkaius can enter a marker state and capitalize on it is very relevant. Now, at 47 or 45 points, he is not a piece you can include in lists lightly. He is very, very expensive, and he needs to be included and piloted with care, but he is high watermark melee lethality with Prothean, with a lot of the things that make Umbra Samaritans very cool, and as such, he's a piece that you have to respect and consider, albeit probably not include in 100% of your lists. The next luxury piece that we want to consider is the Shazvastiai Tactical Dominant Special Wing Noctifer. Uh, they have been around for longer than I have in this game. They are the old nightmare that lurks in the shadow, and for their points cost are one of the most fearsome hidden deployment AROs in the entire game. We are of course talking in particular here about the Shazvastiai Noctifer Missile Launcher. It is a hidden deployment, Mimetism 6, Camouflage, Dogged, BS-12 Missile Launcher, and it has ruined and won many games by itself. If your opponent is moving a link team forward and this thing reveals, they are going to brown their pants. Now, as with a few of the pieces, it can be difficult to fit Noctifers in many or even any lists. That 1.5 SWC can be difficult to include. 30 points is not cheap. Sorry, 32 points is not cheap, although it can be very worthwhile. But the thing about Noctifers is that you don't have to include them all the time. You just have to include them some of the time. Now, SWC is at such a premium in Onyx Contact Force that, generally speaking, your opponent will be able to tell. If there is one and a half SWC missing, there is a good chance your opponent will look at the table and be like, can I see 14 troops or 15? And if you say 14, they will start looking out, looking out for and trying to play against Noctifers. But getting into your opponent's head in that way has its own merits. And look, yes, Noctifers are just very, very solid, very scary. That missile launcher ARO is truly fearsome. While we're talking about Noctifers, a tactic that you may wish to be aware of is the fact that it is actually legal to stack AROs combining Noctifers with other troops. Now, this is a little gamey, but we'll work through how it goes. When you deploy a model using hidden deployment, you place it down, take a photograph, otherwise mark its location on the table, and then remove it. And once you've removed it, it's treated as if it wasn't there. Now, this rule exists because if you have a hidden deployment model in the midfield, your opponent, not knowing it's there, could very reasonably deploy something in the exact same place. And if that happens, there need to be rules for how we resolve two models existing in the same place. And how we do that is when the Noctifer reveals, if it's revealing in a place that's otherwise occupied, we just reveal it kind of as close as we can, at which point it acts Normally. What this means though is that you can, for example, deploy a Noctifer, say up in a tower, note its location, remove it from the table, and then deploy a Unidron missile launcher or a Q drone in the exact same position. This means that when your opponent moves to engage, say the Unidron missile launcher or the Q drone, you can say, ah, I have two AROs. Firstly, I'm going to ARO with the Undron, it'll fire its missiles. And secondly, a Noctifer is existing in the same position. I'll just put it to the side here. That's the closest that it can go and still be legal. It still has line of fire. I'm going to take a face to face roll with it as well. Welcome to burst three missile launchers in ARO. How would you like to spend your ballistic skill attacks? Now, this can be kind of a dangerous tactic to work with because once you've revealed all of this, it's kind of very obvious you've spent three SWC potentially watching just one space on the table. So you need to make a judgment call as to whether or not that is actually worth your time. But you also have the option in that instance of not revealing the Nocta for the first time around. Your opponent puts your Unidron down and then moves thinking that, that space is safe, at which point you can reveal the Nocta and have the whole nightmare happen all over again. The fact that it is Dogged works well with the fact we're not going to be taking that many engine, that many Doctors in Onyx Contact Force, so Dogged troops that aren't remotes we quite like. We're very willing to have them go Dogged and then die. And fighting through just one Noctifer, if your opponent does not have the ability to overcome its Mimitism minus six, can take an entire turn by itself and result in multiple casualties. Again, the SWC cost of the Noctifer means that you cannot include them in every list. They're often, they're often a little telegraphed if you do, but they're very good if you do choose to take them. Also, don't sleep on the fact that that Missile Launcher profile has an Assault Pistol. Yes, it's only damage 13, but Burst 4 off of a BS-12 Mimitism 6 profile can and will occasionally win games. I have absolutely 
one games ramboing in with the Assault Pistol Noctifer. Uh, that thing's scary AF if it's able to fight things that the Assault Pistol can harm. Up next, we have the Greif Operator, uh, notable for the fact that in Onyx Contact Force, it costs only a half SWC. Now, that's a half SWC that we don't always have, but the Greif Operator is the cheapest impersonator in the entire game. And while it's basically just a Ballistic Skill 11 MSV1 line troop with just some gun, it has a combi rifle and a plus one burst breaker pistol, impersonation is still a very, very strong rule. Onyx Contact Force otherwise don't always have the ability to reach out and touch unhackable targets. Sometimes they have to, you know, they're going to have to launch close assaults, for example, to get what they want. And so having a piece like a Greif Operator, they can just land in or adjacent to your opponent's deployment zone and immediately begin prosecuting an offensive can be really just kind of powerful. Also, D charges on a model that starts in your opponent's half of the table can do the sabotage classified very easily. And in resilience operations, it can be very useful to have a model that can just complete certain objectives immediately on the first turn with access to decharges. Again, a little bit of a niche pick, but something that's interesting and worth considering. Finally, we have the Fractor Drop Unit. Now, the Fractor Drop Unit is one of those pieces that is just kind of like perennially slept on, but which is very, very worth the cost if you have some way to guarantee its ability to land. For example, if you're playing a faction that habitually includes an Evo Hacker for other reasons. You only need Assisted Combat Drop Op jump up long enough for the Fractor to land, and Fractor are a two-wound combat jump trooper with perfectly reasonable stats. Now, Fractor are actually a funny example of a combat jump, so of a transmutation creature that gets stronger when it transmutes. We can see that the survival form, so basically when it lands, if it takes a wound, the jump armor that it landed in like hardens around it and actually increases its armor and its BTS. You will not get to take advantage of that particularly often. Uh, you should really just think of this as, yep, it's an armor one, but a two wound combat jump trooper with ballistic skill 11 and a whole selection of useful profiles. The base combi rifle profile has the wonderful advantage of coming with a nanopulsar, which means that you can use that template weapon to potentially trade wounds, although of course the boarding shotgun is superior being a burst 2 damage 14 template if that's what you want. And the Spitfire also has some serious merit. Now, I mentioned before, the Noctifer is a piece that you want to include just occasionally if you can to put the fear into your opponent, but it's kind of telegraphed. Your opponents, particularly after playing against the Noctifer once or twice, will learn to recognize that one and a half one and a half SWC, 30 point gap in your list. Well, what if we were to include a one and a half SWC, 33 point jump troop in our lists? It occupies almost exactly the same space as an, a Noctifer. It is equally invisible until it appears, and it represents a very, very different kind of threat for almost exactly the same points cost and SWC which comes with the added benefit of forcing your opponent to jump at noctifer size shadows for the entirety of the game until the Fractor appears. Now, normally I would be a little wary of spending one and a half SWC on a Spitfire in OCF, but it's on a model that will typically be landing its combat jump on 15s, and the Spitfire in particular does have the advantage of, look, if it flubs its roll, it's still a Spitfire in your deployment zone, that's not the worst thing in the world. Now, there is a hacker profile, which is a specialist, but at only whip 12, I'm generally not going to advise against that. It's also kind of easy to go after whip 12 hackers with enemy KHDs. Typically, I would steer towards treating the Fractor as a dangerous offensive piece in a faction that gets basically support wear available in most of its armies at very low opportunity cost. You can really use drop troops in combined army, and the Fractor is the one that you'll be using most of the time because for its cost, what it delivers is kind of the best. Now, speaking of combat jump troopers, we are going to just very briefly touch on all of the tags OCF has access to, because they have access to a whopping four separate tag model slash units in the sectoral. Despite this, I would strongly argue that OCF is not a tag faction. All of the tags it has access to are kind of niche, and frankly, I don't recommend regularly taking any of them, but some of them are real freaking funny, and the Cascuda in particular is one of those. The Cascuda is a, look, it, look it's a combat jump tag, okay? It's a, it's a tag that literally just like drops like an angry fist of God onto your opponent anywhere on the table and then starts fighting. At 64 points, it is honestly reasonably costed, but I am not typically willing to spend 64 points on a model that, frankly, might fail its combat jump. You'll be landing on 17s most of the time, but that is still a 15% chance of failure, which is a bit squirrely. 
and subsequently trying to make things happen with an armor-piercing damage 15 combi rifle or just a chain rifle plus one burst, admittedly a damage 15 chain rifle, it's just a little sh combi rifle range bans. Yes, I know that it lands with combat jump, it can always be in combi rifle range, but tags don't really want to fight in combi rifle range. The thing about tags is that they are eminently hackable, total control is an absolute bitch and completely ruined your day. And the Cascuda is often going to have to brave enemy networks in order to be fully effective. So you really need to set the Cascuda up with things like eliminating enemy hackers, making it safe for it to land, then having Evo hackers prepare the way so that it lands on 17s, and then actually landing it. Often the Cascuda will be appearing only if you have already established wonderful conditions in which you would otherwise win the game. Now, that said... It's a hilarious meme. It's a combat jump tag. I cannot in good conscience tell you never to take it because it's just too funny to take when you actually do. I have no idea what a good list built around a Cascuda actually looks like. I'm sure there's at least one out there and it's probably particularly scary if you're playing. For example, if you were building a list for different matchups and you wanted something that would play well against Ariadna where you didn't need to take lots of killer hackers, the Cascuda might slot in there. So I have no idea. I have no idea how the Cascuda gets into a list. If you are a veteran Onyx Contact Force player that has made the Cascuda work, please do post a list in the comments because it absolutely deserves playtime if only for the absolute hilarious and shock value of landing the damn thing. Even more expensive than the Cascuda, but probably more playable, we have the Shazvastai Armored Core Sphinx. I have used the Sphinx in a battle report, uh, and the thing about the Sphinx is that it's a ballistic skill 15, non ballistic skill 14, damage 15, non armor piercing Spitfire, which means that the Sphinx is a predator element. You have to use that incredible mobility, 6 6 move, hidden deployment, camouflage, mimetism 6 to climbing plus, to cross the table, kill a bunch of things your opponent didn't want killed, and then get to a safe position. And you, you can't necessarily always do that because sometimes your opponent does something like just put a tag in ARO. And the Sphinx can, thanks to Summitism 6, fight through some tags, but 93 points and 2 SWC exerts a colossal weight on your list construction, which Onyx can struggle to bear. In vanilla combined army, you can do things like just spam a whole bunch of tiger creatures or gakis into a list to make up a little bit of bulk and weight. In Onyx Contact Force, you can't. There is a flaw to how cheap our units get in this faction, and so actually making a Sphinx work can be very challenging, but it's a heckin' cool piece. Much like the Cascuda, it deserves at least some occasional playtime, although I would say that if you start down the path of playing a Sphinx, commit to it for at least a little while, because making use of that mobility and learning how to leverage its firepower in a way that is truly maximal takes time. The Sphinx is one of those pieces where if you learn how to use it, much better than your opponent knows how to defend against it, it has that actual power that can be unearthed, and I can guarantee you that somewhere out there, there is that Sphinx player that is an absolute terror to their local environment and who turn up to you know other tournaments and just catch players completely by surprise in terms of the effectiveness with which they've learned how to use this delicate, fragile, dangerous piece. Finally, we have, sorry, second to last, we have Zeodron Batroids. Zeodrons are... Ultimately, they are relatively low 1, 0, or 0 0.5 SWC pieces, and that, I think, is their genuine utility at Onyx Contact Force. 6-2 move and super jump is nice. You can theoretically harass link these pieces. If you do, do it on an absolute budget. Do not take two Zeodrons and a Samaritan. Owen from Canberra, if you are listening to this, I'm talking to you in particular, please stop doing that. Instead, take these things supported by cheaper, lighter troops. Something like, for example, a Nexus operative and an Umbra and a Zeodron is much more affordable and much more palatable than two Zeodrons and an Umbra Samaritan. Now, if you do choose to take these, they are only Ballistic Skill 13, but a 0 SWC Burst 4 K1 Marksman Rifle, even a Burst 3 K1 Marksman Rifle on a piece that's relatively durable, is kind of credible. And just generally having access to those cheaper pieces, sorry, cheaper SWC-wise pieces that let you take bigger guns on your unit Drawn can have some merit. Uh, these things are AVA4. Never ever take four of these unless you're doing something like a 400 point limited insertion event, which I have actually seen run on the regular in some places in Australia as an annual meme event. Use these very sparingly. In fact, 
shared between the Zeodron and the Overdrawn, which we'll cover next and last, I think is probably one of the greatest injustices in Infinity. And if I could make one rules change to Onyx Contact Force, it would be to add just a little rules blurb underneath the Zeodron, like the ones that they have in Ariadna for Dog Warriors that says the AVA of Dog Warriors is shared across all Dog Warrior type soldiers. Just add a little thing underneath Zeodron and Overdrawns that say, Zeodrons and Overdrawns may be targeted by support wear as if they were remotes, because they are the same kind of model. They are just bigger, fatter Unidrons. They're built in the exact same way. And being able to support wear these guys would absolutely open up a significant niche for them. Frankly, you might need to increase their cost slightly if you did that, but it's just something that would make Onyx just a bit more unique. Maybe something add something to Vanilla Combined Army as well. Not that Vanilla Combined Army needs any more than they already have, but it would really, really both thematically fit and benefit these guys kind of a little. And that of course leads us on to Overdrawn Batroids as the last of the units that we will cover in this particular video. Overdrawn Batroids are your fire support remote. Uh, interestingly, they can be duoed. Don't duo two Overdrawn Batroids. Instead, duo them with something like a Nexus NCO Engineer, which combares, re combines reasonably well with the remote presence tag. Ultimately, Overdrawns are not bad, but they are very SWC and points expensive. 63 points for a HRMC doesn't sound that bad until you realize that the Overdrawn is only Ballistic Skill 13, and that's genuinely just low enough to make committing with this thing to a firefight a bit more difficult than it needs to be. Regardless, all of the profiles have some utility. A plasma sniper rifle, plus one burst, plus one damage is dangerous enough that you really have to take, you know, if you have to pay attention to it. The HRMC is burst five. And then the heavy rocket launcher, plus one burst submachine gun has the benefit both of being able to enter into suppressive fire and still fight at longer range bands and only costing 51 points. But again, 1.5 SWC is quite a lot in a faction that wants to spend it on other things. You can absolutely fit an overdrawn into your list. And if you do, you have the wonderful benefit of Albedo. Infinity's most useless rule, nine games out of 10, and it's most weirdly useful, but still not that great in the 10th game out of 10. Overdrawn are awesome models though, and at 51 to 63 points, you can occasionally fit one of them into a list uh, where they will do totally serviceable work, in particular, if you leverage the fact that they are a remote presence repairable tag. So closing out the episode, we have on screen there an example of a list that I think makes good use of some, not all, but some of the strengths available to Onyx Contact Force. It is a two Harris team, one core list with 12 linkable troopers. It has a Unidrawn Core link, a Unidrawn Harris link, and an extra Harris tank link, which is really making maximum use of the fact that Onyx Contact Force has access to all of those fire teams, which we are then supporting with a variety of pieces, including an unlinked Nexus Engineer with a Slave Drone, an Evo Hacker, and Bit and Kiss. Now, this is all ultimately pretty basic, and it would benefit, for example, from having kind of more repeaters in there. You're going to need to be using uh, bits deployable repeater mine layer to extend your hacking area, even just to apply your uh, support wear in this particular list. But it is a list that does that thing that I cherish in list construction, which is that this is a list where literally every single one of those 15 troopers is capable of taking offensive action and doing useful things. That's actually very rare in Infinity, and while it might genuinely be more sensible to condense some of these pieces down, put some Icadrons in, put some Imatrons in, use that to put some more elite units into the list, having that 15 troopers, every single one of them can do the mission, take fights, contribute to the game, is genuinely nice to have and very fun to play. It's also got plenty of gunfighting, plenty of ARO presence, it's spending all six of those points either on hackers to engage, support your list or engage the enemy, or just big guns to fight. And it's even managed to accommodate not just one, but two plasma sniper rifles in addition to the missile launcher which we'll be using for ARO duty. Per viewer request, I will put the list code for this list in underneath the pinned comment in the video description below if you'd like to take a look and fiddle around yourself. Now, that concludes our faction focus on Onyx Contact Force. I hope you enjoyed this. As a reminder, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so via the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below or by becoming a channel member on YouTube. Big thanks to everyone who has already. And I do take topic and faction requests for battle reports from channel supporters and channel members. Onyx Contact Force, I'm aware, is likely to be a faction with some very experienced long-term players who have some very different opinions on what is strong about the faction and how they would build lists. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm very welcoming of people making those posts and comments in the comment section below. I'm very interested to see how other people play and choose to play and build for this faction. As always, I hope you enjoyed this. I will be back with more content soon. 
faction focuses, battle reports, and otherwise.